Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk. We have a great show for you today. Let's get to our topics. First, some breaking news in the Chad Daybell matter. Could affect Lori Vallow. Apparently, nobody wants to go to trial. The man responsible for Jeffrey Dahmer's demise. The Wisconsin parade suspect gets his wish. That's right. Be careful what you wish for. You may just get it. This cop is a legend. We need this guy cloned and sent into every type of situation. We need this guy. And then finally, our dumb criminal of the day. Let's talk about it. All right, aficionados, you know the drill. Subscribe if you haven't, like if you do, hit that bell for notifications, leave me a comment, and remember you can listen to us on any of your favorite podcasting apps simply by downloading any episode of Crime Talk. Just search Crime Talk with Scott Reich. All right, let's go ahead and open the docket for September 29th, 2022. Now, I would like to say that I was going to be wrong but I'm not. I would like to say that I have the exact motion in front of me so that I could go through it and explain it to you. But unfortunately, I can't because the Idaho court system will let us have a copy of the motions in the uh, uh, Chad Daybell, Lori Vallow matters when we, when they are gosh darn good and ready and not a moment sooner. In, I mean, in today's technology, you can't just post something immediately. No, you got to wait three, five days, maybe weeks before it gets there. Well, guess what? That's right. Chad Daybell, through his attorney, has filed a motion to continue the jury trial, which is scheduled to start in January, at least until next fall. Sometime in October is what Mr. Pryor, the attorney for Chad Daybell, is asking for. And in addition to that, he's renewing his motion for severance. As you may recall, Mr. Pryor, on behalf of Mr. Daybell, had filed a motion for severance previously. The court, Judge Boyce, denied that motion and said, we're going to go to trial in January. And the court previously denied a motion to continue on behalf of Mr. Pryor, where he wanted the trial set in October of 2023. The prosecution said, well, we could start in September of 2023. We're completely fine with that. But Lori Vallow would not waive her right to a speedy trial. Therefore, the court set January as the trial date. So what does this really mean? Well, first, Mr. Pryor says in his motion, at least so I've read, been told, Because like I said, Idaho courts don't think we should have a copy of this anytime soon. I mean, it's only the most watched and talked about case going on right now, but it doesn't really matter. The American people are too stupid for these complex matters uh, that are being discussed. Well, let me explain them for you then, because that's what the courts think. We're all too stupid. Mr. Pryor is saying that there is a substantial amount of investigation and preparation along with a significant amount of evidence he says that he has still not received from the prosecutors. I'm sure the prosecutors saying, oh, we're working on it or we've turned it all over. That's their typical response. Anyway, he says, Mr. Pryor, anyway, Mr. Pryor says there's no possible way to complete the investigation and be prepared for a death penalty case in January of 2023. And he says, obviously the standard stuff, this is a death penalty case. It requires a, um, unique amount of time. And let's face it, when it's a death penalty case, since it is the ultimate punishment, well, you get super due process, uh, no doubt. And Mr. Pryor has said that, hey, I've been consuming my time on the investigation as the factual scenario here. But if we go to trial and we lose, then we're immediately going to go into the death penalty phase. And therefore, I need to start working on that, which I haven't already done. So judge, I'm going to need more time. So what does that really amount to? Well, he says, Judge, I'm not ready. And although he didn't say it, at least from what I've seen, he probably threw in that Mr. Daybell has an absolute right to effective assistance of counsel under the Sixth Amendment to the United States Constitution and the applicable Idaho Constitution as well. And therefore, Judge, if you want to make me ineffective, make me go to trial in January. It will be a free pass. 
okay? It'll be a free do-over. So what do I think is going to happen in that regard? Well, I think the judge will have to grant the continuance. I hate to say it, but I think that's what's going to have to take place. I know the judge doesn't want to go to trial, and he doesn't want to do this trial twice. But if Lori Vallow doesn't waive speedy trial, then that's not going to happen. But more importantly is that a motion for severance has been filed. And the significance of the motion for severance, which has previously been denied, but can be renewed and should be renewed at every stages of the proceeding. Seriously, if the if Judge Boyce denies the motion for severance, Mr. Pryor would have to literally make a motion for severance each and every day before trial at the close of the prosecution's case in chief, as well as at the end of the defense case in chief, if one is presented, to continually renew the motion for severance. If they are convicted and if they have a joint trial and an appellate court determines that Mr. Pryor should have had a separate trial, guess what? You get a do-over all over again. Automatic reversal. Now, what is Mr. Pryor saying that would require a separate trial? Well, Mr. Pryor is alleging that he, his client, Chad Daybell, should not be tried with Lori Vallow because it would deprive his client of his constitutional right to present a complete defense. Now, Mr. Pryor apparently has alleged that he plans to introduce prior bad acts, 404B evidence, kind of reverse 404B evidence, for Ms. Vallow and Mr. Cox, Lori Daybell's, or Lori Vallow's deceased brother. Specifically, he's apparently going to introduce or attempt to introduce evidence regarding their relationship and the death of Mr. Cox. Mr. Pryor also noted that Chad Daybell is requesting a, obviously the continuance of the trial date, but that Lori Vallow has not waived her right to a speedy trial, and because of that, the cases should be separate. Uh, Mr. Daybell's attorney also argued that a joint trial would violate uh, Chad's right, his constitutional rights. He notes in part that uh, one of Chad's possible defenses would be to blame Lori Vallow and her brother in the conspiracy, and that wouldn't be fair to have uh, Chad to be prosecuted as a co-defendant. Now, this is what I've said all along. I don't know why at this point in the proceedings it's taken so long to figure this out. It was rather simple. The way that Chad Daybell is going to raise a defense is that he didn't do it. Lori Vallow and her brother, Alex Cox, are, are the ones that did it. They're crazy, and he should be allowed to introduce that evidence. But that would be potentially prejudicial and unfair to Lori Vallow. It wouldn't necessarily come in uh, in any way. In fact, Lori Vallow could say that Chad Daybell was the one that did it in her trial. You think you would think everyone would want separate trials in this case, but I've seen nothing filed because we don't get to see anything filed in this case, which goes back to my biggest grievance about Idaho is they all think we're a bunch of incompetent boobs and we can't handle it and that this is somehow going to prejudice uh, everybody in this case. It's ridiculous. It doesn't take a rocket scientist. A guy like me can figure it out what the defense is going to be. Lori Val is going to say, I'm crazy. Chad DeBell is going to say, she did it and She's crazy. I didn't know what she was doing. Did I mention that she's crazy? Everybody knows she's in the hospital. How is that going to prejudice anything? Really? Come on, Idaho. Get your act together. Now, for those who aren't familiar with this case, remember, Lori Vallow is charged in Arizona with conspiracy to murder her previous husband, Charles Vallow, uh, who was shot to death by, that's right, Alex Cox, Lori Vallow's brother, weeks before the death of the children, um, Tammy and Tammy Daybell, Chad Daybell's wife, who they all thought had some dark spirits in them, basically that they were possessed. Now, Alex Cox claimed self-defense in that shooting, but he mysteriously died in November of 2020, just a few months after the shooting, purportedly from natural causes. So, um, and as we noted, Boyce combined, and as we noted previously, Judge Boyce combined the trials of the husband and wife back in uh, October of 2020, Pryor had previously filed a motion to sever in September of 2021, but Boyce denied that motion. 
maybe it's just my frustration with not being able to see these motions uh, because it's just ridiculous the way they're doing things there. But yeah, I'm getting a little frustrated, okay? Um, it's not, I don't understand what the secrets are. What is the big secret there in Idaho? Why do they keep acting like this is a big secret? Judge Boyce needs to realize this is just a case. It is one of many cases that will come through and it should be treated like any other case. It doesn't need any special treatment. It doesn't need anything uh, that would not be allowed by any other proceeding. And he is turning this thing into the biggest cluster that probably anyone has ever seen. He's gonna join the wall of fame of worst judges. That's right, right next to Judge Lance Ito the one who handled the O.J. Simpson trial, turned a simple three-week trial into an eight-month trial. We are now three months, no, we are now three years from when these children disappeared. Three years, and really, we have accomplished nothing. Let's get to it, Idaho. And of course, it'll be interesting to see what position the prosecutor takes on these cases. What they should say is, fine, Chad Daybell, we'll see you in October if that's what you want. And Lori Vallow, we'll see you in January. Let's do this thing. Somehow, I don't think they're gonna. Next on the docket, while we're you know talking about serial killers, why not talk about Jeffrey Dahmer? You know, the one that maybe killed, I don't know, 17 people, something to that effect. And now there's a Netflix series about him, but what do we really want to know? How about the guy who actually did in Jeffrey Dahmer? And like I said, it's all a buzz these days because of that Netflix series called The Monster, The Jeffrey Dahmer Story. Now folks have uh, come to realize that uh, his victims were predominantly uh, men of color. Plus the guy who uh, killed him uh, in prison, a guy by the name of Christopher Scarver, uh, was also uh, a black man. Now, Christopher Scarver, who fatally beat the serial killer and another inmate in 1994, said he grew to despise Mr. Dahmer because he would fashion several limbs out of prison food to taunt other inmates. He would apparently drizzle packets of ketchup as blood. And uh, he stated that it was a little bit unnerving and that uh, Dahmer would put them in places where people would be. Now, Scarver arrived at the Wisconsin Columbia Correctional Institution about the same time as Dahmer did in 1992 and knew right away to keep safe distance uh, from the alleged serial killer. Well, I guess he's convicted at that time, isn't he? Anyway, Mr. Scarver said the madman had a personal escort of at least one guard at all times when he was out of his cell because of friction with other inmates. You know, everybody wants to take out the most hated guy in the place so they can get a little bit of credibility. Anyway, apparently Scarver watched Dahmer from afar uh, on the prison yard, but never approached him because he did not want to become a target of his humor. On November 28, 1994, Mr. Scarver doled out his vigilante justice in a gymnasium of the uh, Wisconsin prison. Now, Scarver and a third inmate, a guy by the name of Jesse Anderson, were led unshackled to clean the bathrooms by correctional officers who then left them all unattended. Scarver, who was repulsed by the uh, molesting uh, cannibal and his lust for flesh, kept in his pocket apparently a newspaper article detailing how Dahmer would um, kill and then dismember uh, some of the 17 men and young boys from 1978 to 1999. Now, Mr. Scarver, then only 25 years old and convicted of murder, had just received his mop and filled his bucket with water when someone poked him in the back. He says that he turned around and Dahmer and Jesse were kind of laughing underneath their breath, as Mr. Scarver recounts in an interview. And he said, I looked right into their eyes and I couldn't tell you which had done it. The three men then split up and Scarver followed Dahmer towards a staff locker room Scarver grabbed a metal bar from the weight room and confronted Mr. Dahmer with the news story he had been carrying in his pocket. Mr. Scarver said that he asked him if he did those things because he was, you know, a little disgusted by the whole stuff. And he was shocked when Dahmer said, yes, he did. He started looking for the door pretty quickly, according to Mr. Scarver. That's Mr. Uh, 
Dahmer. Anyway, well, anyway, Mr. Scarver then says that he just, well, he ended up dead and he put his head down. He then casually crossed the gym and entered a locker room where Mr. Anderson was working. He stopped for a second and looked around. He looked to see if uh, any other officials were there. No one was there. Pretty much the same thing happened. He got his head put down, according to Mr. Scarver. Um, Anderson was also serving a life sentence for killing his wife back in 1992. And Scarver believes it had, Scarver believes it was no accident that he ended up alone with Dahmer since prison officials knew that he hated that guy and that they, everybody wanted him dead. Uh, they had something to do with what took place, he says. And uh, Scarver noted that uh, the guards disappeared just before he clobbered Mr. Dahmer with a 20-inch, uh, five-pound metal bar. Gerald Boyle, who defended Dahmer at his trial, uh, doesn't believe it. Neither does Stephen Cohen, who represented Mr. Scarver. He says it's ridiculous. Uh, at the time, he said Scarver never said a word about Dahmer's taunting anyone in jail or prison or joking about his crimes. Boyle said that he had a list of five guys who he did not feel were worthy of the word murderer because of who and how they killed their victims. Uh, Cohen said nothing in the public record supports what Mr. Scarver says in uh, various news articles since his conviction. And in an interview with Mr. Boyle, he recalls that Scarver said that Dahmer and Anderson had murdered for unacceptable reasons and that it was humiliating to be in the same work detail with them. Anyway, you can make up your mind, um, you know, probably no big loss to the world. And if you look at the Netflix series, I uh, have watched nearly all of it. And I could say it's uh, the word that this comes to my mind is disturbing. Very, very disturbing. Next on the docket, be careful what you wish for. Remember Mr. Daryl Brooks? We brought you the video the other day where he was jousting with the judge because he wanted to represent himself. Yeah, that's right. The guy that's alleged to have killed six people by ramming an SUV into the annual Christmas parade in Waukesha, Wisconsin last November. Well, guess what? He's been given the go-ahead and he can represent himself in his upcoming trial. That's what the judge ruled today. Things were only a little slightly more cordial between Mr. Brooks and the uh, judge as the day before. Now the uh, defendant continued to speak over the judge and the judge explained uh, the challenges, case law, and potential drawbacks of firing his attorneys. And uh, the, as the banter went back and forth, you are being difficult, she said at one point. And he says, you're not, she says, you're not listening. Mr. Brooks, your rights do not involve interrupting me, she said at another point. She warned him that there was a possibility he could be admonished in front of a jury at trial if he continued with such outbursts. So the judge determined on Wednesday that Mr. Brooks was competent to act as his own attorney, and she formally discharged his lawyers. Despite her clear reservations, going back to earlier in the week, in the hearing stating that she is not going to appoint standby counsel. She's not going to say, here are your attorney. They're going to be ready to go if you change your mind. Nope, he's on his own. And remember, Brooks is charged as, like I said, driving uh, the SUV into the Christmas parade back in November of 2021. Dozens were injured and six people were killed in that particular situation. And now he's turning it into a complete farce. Now, Mr. Brooks has maintained uh, in court that he is a sovereign citizen. And so-called sovereign citizens assert that the government has no true legal sway over them because they, not the government, are the sovereign. Hmm. Hmm. Why didn't we all think of that? Oh, because it's complete nonsense. Okay, this is going to be the biggest fiasco around. And clearly, this guy knows that he has no defense. He's going down. And it's just going to be a, well, cluster. But at least it's not the judge doing it like it is in Idaho. It's the pro se defendant. But take a look at the picture of the public defenders leaving the courtroom. Look at those smiles. I have seen, and I know that smile. That's a smile of relief. Those public defenders are saying, hey, we're off this case. 
Now you get to see what they've been dealing with, and now he's your problem. Good luck. Next on the docket, this cop in Washington State is a legend as far as I'm concerned. Nerves of steel. Think of all those incidents in schools where police froze, didn't do the right thing. We need to clone this guy and send him everywhere. This guy is the most ice cold gunslinging lawman in all of the state of Washington. Look at this guy, calmly parks, puts down his cup of coffee, gets out of the car, grabs his rifle, sights in, uses the cruiser to brace himself, then downed an active shooter at 183 yards. Boom, nice shot. What was this guy whistling the Andy Griffith tune the whole time too? Well, investigators concluded that the uh, guy that was firing the shots and uh, the police had actually returned rounds over a 16 minute period, but the last shot came from this particular officer, Officer Christopher Munn, who's a hero, who fired his weapon from 183 yards, standing up and ended the situation. And I love how he says, yeah, I love how he says at the end, shots fired, subject down, bam. We need these, we need guys like that everywhere. So next time there's an active uh, shooter going on, we can send them that way. And then finally, our dumb criminal of the day. A deceased woman's son has uh, called out a New Jersey man on Facebook who he's accused of peeing and defecating on his mother's grave. And he wrote a lengthy post on social media after finding persistent traces of urine alongside plastic bags that were filled with feces at his mother's grave site. And the grave site is in Orangetown, New York. Now, the man claimed that the other man later identified as his mother's ex-husband, the guy by the name of Dean Eichler, whom she divorced in 1974 and hadn't been in contact with since at least 1976, had made it his daily routine to pee and defecate near or on the woman's headstone. Uh, apparently, the disturbing act would lead um, Mr. Murphy to place a hidden camera after uh, being granted permission by the cemetery officials as it appeared that uh, the uh, feces had already uh, piled up and now they got evidence against Mr. Eichler. A video clip of uh, Mr. Eichler getting out of his car and unzipping his pants before peeing on the uh, gravesite. Uh, apparently they have weeks and months of evidence and it's been re reported to the police and um, no one's exactly sure why he would do this since they haven't had any contact with him since 1976 but a summons has been issued to Mr. Eichler for urinating in public. Now, Mr. Eichler, hey, I mean, the woman's dead. You haven't really seen her in almost 50 years. I'd say get over it. Just want to let it go, let it go. Um, but what have we said here before, ladies and gentlemen? Uh, there's cameras everywhere, even in <laughs> cemeteries, apparently. So, Mr. Eichler, you, are our dumb criminal of the day. All right, thanks for watching. Have a wonderful day, not just a good day, and we will see you tomorrow on Crime Talk.